Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, so this morning, what I'd like to do is give a historical overview about what Australia has done uh, in protecting its trade. So from the early days of European settlement until really the first years of the 20th century, um, there, there was a concern in Australia about protecting um, uh, trade and, uh, and concern about interdiction by various powers. Um, and they range from N Napoleonic France, uh, Russia, Germany, and then Japan. Um, indeed, the need to protect trade and to keep the ports open was a major driver for the formation of the colonial navies, uh, for maintaining the, uh, the, the British uh, uh, squadron on the Australia station, and also for the birth of the Royal Australian Navy. While some of the concerns, um, such as the case of, it's got a message for this phone. Uh, while some of the concerns, such as the, the case for Imperial Russia, and uh, was somewhat alarmist, the concerns that uh, Australia did have for its trade in the case of Japan and um, and Germany was actually quite well founded. At the outbreak of the First World War, the RN's priority was to neutralise the threat uh, of its sea trade uh, by the German East Asia Squadron. And you can see in this slide the German squadron at Rabaul. And Australia was concerned that Rabaul would be a forward operating base for the Germans to interdict trade and also to uh, actually attack our ports. And so one of the first actions of of Australia's defence forces was in fact to uh, capture Rabaul and, and also the fact that we had a, a moderately large fleet led by um, the battlecruiser HMS Australia act as a major deterrent for that squadron which went um, east and away from the Australia station and went round into the South Atlantic and also it was our squadron that was our fleet was actually able to engage and sink the lone raider left which was the Emden. The main threat, therefore, was from surface ships. But in the second half of the war, our torpedo boat destroyers did operate against Austrian submarines and surface ships attempting to interdict trade and uh, shipping in the Adriatic and the Mediterranean. In some theatres, such as the North Atlantic, techniques such as convoys and, and early anti-submarine detection and destruction systems were employed. Um, but the REN only had limited exposure to these innovations. It's worthwhile to discuss the logic of convoying. Essentially, convoying is a response to the, uh, the laws of probability. Convoys concentrate merchant ships so that there are fewer parts of the ocean in which they can be found by adversary. The escorts are also concentrated with the convoy, and there's hopefully sufficient escorts to, um, to actually deal with any uh, adversary forces. While convoys, to many, appear an anachronism, um, in certain conflicts they're still relevant today. Importantly, in World War I, our Navy uh, had merchant ships... Uh, uh, sorry, I should say, our, uh, the Australian fleet protected merchant ships, which were vital to trade and also to troop movement and the sustainment of our uh, economy. This was part of a global allied effort, and that's an important aspect about protection of trade. Australia's first defence and Navy Minister, Senator Sir George Pearce, wrote prior to the war, we believe that we can, by building a local Navy, render the best assistance to the Empire interests everywhere. And, uh, and so it proved, and I think what we're seeing in the Straits of Hormuz is, once again, it is part of a, a bigger coalition type operation in terms of protecting global trade. Now I want to turn to the interwar period. In the interwar period, despite a paucity of funds, there was important developments in the field of trade protection. In 1923, the REN sent two officers, uh, James Esdale and Harry Melville, to undertake just the fourth um, Royal Navy's ASW specialist courses that had done uh, kicked off in, in 
in the, um, the early 20s. Isdal stayed uh, on at HMS, HMS Osprey, the anti-submarine school, and took part in trials on submarine detection and also performance. And in fact, one of his um, things which uh, proved to be quite true was that it was important to actually get performance of um, anti-submarine detection systems in different environments. And when he came back to Australia, he advocated the need to do trials in different parts around Australia to really understand performance of um, ASDIC or sonar systems, as they later became called. Um, instead of actually going to sea when he returned to Australia, he actually went to, to Navy office and he helped develop the, um, the Navy's anti-submarine plans. Esdale and others, and combined with the intellectual and material assistance of the Royal Navy, developed a comprehensive plan to counter the emerging submarine threat. In 1925, the British Committee for Imperial Defence wrote an influential paper titled The Requirements for Minesweeper and Auxiliary Anti-Submarine Vessels at Various Empire Ports in the Event of War in the East, and that, of course, included Australia. By the late 1920s, the Royal Australian Navy had developed a three-pronged approach, and this is it uh, on this slide. The key ports would have boom, defense, boom defences, a series of indicator loops on the harbour bottom, as well as ASDIC, later called sonar, as I said, on smaller warships and auxiliaries, and destruction would be achieved by depth charges. The second element was in the approaches to ports, and along the coast, corvettes, sloops um, and auxiliaries uh, would protect the vital coastal shipping. And finally, uh, offshore, cruisers and destroyers would be fitted with sonar and depth charges. And of note, the first sonar to be fitted to an RN ship was actually the cruiser Sydney. At the same time, similar plans were put in place to deal with mines laid by submarines and surface raiders. It's not always appreciated that one of the key missions of the Navy's cruisers at that time was actually trade protection and to counter the threat of commerce raiders, be they a warship or a converted merchant ship. Germany com commenced a trade war involving pocket battleships, cruisers, auxiliary cruisers, such as no most notably the Cormoran, which sank um, the cruiser Sydney, and submarines. And it's not well known that the U-862 operated off the Australian and New Zealand coasts during one part of the war. Most challenging, though, was the rate of threat. We assigned a cruiser on each coast to, to help deal with this unpredictable foe. Typically, though, one only knew that there was a radar in the area when you actually got a, a signal or identified survivors from a merchant ship which had been attacked. So in many cases, it was always a case of being reactive to, uh, to where the radar had been. It was this uh, reactive approach that led to um, an important development really for defence, which was the creation of the first combined operational intelligence centre to bring together the resources of the three services to effectively try and counter the radar threat. By the end of the campaign, the Germans would have sunk over 30 ships and, and significantly disrupted both trade and also um, uh, the, the transport of uh, important war material. Intelligence was of critical importance to protecting shipping and the breaking of the German codes enabled merchant ships to be routed wherever possible through areas where the submarines were not and where raiders were potentially not. The routing or naval control of shipping would remain an important tool in the post-war period. For their part, the Japanese attacks on trade were mainly from submarines. There were, however, occasional surface ship forays, uh, particularly into the Indian Ocean, and of course air attacks in Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific waters. Japanese submarines operated as far as South Australia. The effectiveness of these forays was mitigated um, by the, the poor quality of their mines. So a lot of these uh, uh, 
long range forays were really designed around uh, mining campaigns. The most notable action, of course, was the attack on Sydney Harbour. The Sydney defences, conceived in the late 1920s by Esdale and the team, while not fully installed, were sufficient, with a dose of luck, to counter the, the midget submarine attack. As in World War II convoying uh, was to prove, uh, as in World War I, in World War II convoying was to prove very effective, not just in the Atlantic but on the Australia station. Um, and uh, the, the growing importance of aircraft was very, very significant. Um, one thing that's probably not uh, realised in, in Australian waters, we operated quite a comprehensive um, convoy system and we uh, had over 250 convoys um, up the east coast and on into New Guinea and, and round to Darwin. The, uh, the importance of both land-based and carrier-based and then frigate-based aircraft really changed the nature of protecting uh, merchant ships from submarines. And this was uh, important in the post-World War II era, era with the rise of the Soviet Navy with their fast uh, submarines in, and ones which were in large numbers. And that really focused Western navies considerably. Uh, it meant that they um, changed the composition of their fleet, they modified um, existing hulls to, to be focused on any submarine warfare um, and also uh, hugely influenced modern designs. Um, the, one of the challenges with this Soviet threat was that they were not only torpedo armed, armed with missile, uh, armed with mines, but also over time introduced anti-ship missiles. So you had a threat which was both uh, anti-surface and anti-air. Australia uh, in that period, really from the 50s, 60s, 70s and into the 80s, put a lot of effort into trying to counter that submarine threat. Um, and that's indicated here by the Australian-designed Icaro missile that was fitted extensively in the fleet. Um, we also developed the Maloka sonar and the Barra sonar buoy. So considerable effort was actually put into trying to counter this challenging threat. In the post-Cold War era, the Australian Defence Force has been involved in trade protection, often in a much lower sort of profile. And I'll just offer a couple of examples. In the lead up to the 2003 Iraq War, the Aryan Task Group and the uh, P3C were involved in escorting shipping um, in the Central and Northern Arabian Gulf. And in this operation, there was protection both in terms of focal points and and escorting individual high-value units. Subsequent to the Iraq conflict, the RN and the RAF have been involved in protection of trade from piracy in the Horn of Africa, and of course now with this latest mission. So to conclude um, this historical survey, so what can we sort of glean from what we've done in the past? First, trade protection has been an abiding mission for the Australian Defence Force but one that sometimes gets pushed aside by uh, the, uh, the, the contemporary operation of the day. Second, trade protection requires a suite of measures, both at sea and also ashore, to counter air surface, subsurface, terrorist, not to mention piracy threats. And finally, it requires skills in areas such as anti-submarine and anti-air warfare, relations with the merchant marine um, that require much time to develop, but ones that can be easily lost. Thank you.